Hello and welcome fellow tennis nerds. As you can see, I am not Jonas, my name is Nikki. A lot of you may recognize me from plenty of other videos that I've done together with Jonas on his YouTube channel, on his Tennis Nerd channel, or of course, the all-encompassing tennis learning platform that we've launched. For those of you that haven't checked it out, head down to the description in this video, click the link and check it out. There's a free trial so you guys can see what it's all about. Um, and a quick summary would be that you can learn to improve your tennis, you can learn to learn how to string, how to customize your own rackets, which racket would be best for your game, and much, much more. Today, we are in Lille in France. We've been invited by Decathlon, or rather, more accurately, Artengo. They, they've got an event tonight. We're not sure exactly what's going to be in the event or what to expect. We just know that they're going to kind of do, it's an, just a one evening thing. They're going to do a, maybe a presentation on how they make their rackets. I don't know if there's going to be a racket launch. I don't know if there's going to be any of their players coming. So to be honest, uh, we're a little bit in the dark, but with um, Artengo, you know that they've got you know a good budget, so I'm sure it's going to be a great evening. And I'm going to do the best I can to capture as much of it as possible to bring you guys along for the ride. Uh, so the event is starting quite soon, so I'm going to get ready and I will see you guys there. Here I am in the taxi on the way from the hotel to the event, and uh, we're excited to see what's in store. You can really tell from the effort that they've gone to, to to really make this like a special event with the whole stage, the lighting, and uh, they've invited a lot of people from Artengo and Decathlon all over the world. And um, we're excited to see what, what's in store. I'm gonna try and get a seat at the front and see what's going on. Outside, they also had a full display of all their gear, their rackets, shoes, equipment, and they also have this kind of uh, tennis wall that you can hit on that you could try. And um, they were explaining their different rackets and their clothing. They had the, both the men's and women's clothing. Plus, they had one of Monfils's personal frames on display, which was quite cool. You could hold it, feel it, pick it up, swing it. Um, one of his his own ones as you can see with his name and logo on it and stuff and his very iconic kind of grip five six um, that he uses The first person up on stage was the director of Artengo, so he's in charge of um, Artengo, which is now obviously Decathlon's specialized racket section, and uh, he was kind of introducing himself. Uh, they were talking about how they want to make the brand more sort of tennis serious, and, um, and a little bit of history of Decathlon, Artengo, and tennis. Then we had one of the engineers but behind a lot of their rackets. He came up on stage to kind of go into more detail about how they make rackets and, and the process behind everything they do, which was really what the event was about. And uh, it was very interesting because obviously they had a lot to share and they could really sort of provide a lot of information and knowledge, talking about their DNA architecture of tennis. And I mean, everything was very visually very nice. And um, they really obviously had put a lot of effort into this event to really showcase a lot of the designing, the behind the scenes stuff that perhaps we don't normally see. Um, obviously, we've seen how rackets are made, but in terms of what a design layup looks like, how they go about designing the cosmetics, uh, talking about how they even decide what colors to use and the designs that they want to kind of go for and keep uh, throughout their range. 
As you can see, they were using the uh, Babala Diagnostic Center, I think it's called, uh, to kind of show the racket sort of specs and stuff. And they wanted to really highlight the differences in you can have the same weight and balance but very different swing weights for those you know for a lot of people that might not know the differences and what that means they kind of they they did a really good job of showing it obviously on the big screen for those that couldn't see at the back then they took us over to what the layup station would look like in a factory which was uh, for me the most interesting part of the of the event was actually seeing the long pieces of carbon fiber and how they use this inner tube to roll out and to add all the right pieces of carbon fiber on as you can see from their layup sheet so each little piece has an effect on where it's placed on the racket obviously imagining that the middle of the long tube is the top of the hoop and um, and then they add different parts of carbon fiber throughout the frame to sort of uh, either to make it more stiff more flexible to give it different characteristics sweet spot all these things are determined by the layup of the frame and this is something that perhaps you've not not many people have seen up close so that was really cool you could they had you know pieces of carbon fiber that they showed around afterwards you could uh, go up and see the racket up close so that, that I thought that was really interesting and how they kind of used like a dummy mold um, to sort of uh, to form the carbon fiber ever so slightly once it's been rolled up and then after that it'll be going into the press as you can see the racket is starting to take shape it has the throat in place and this is what then will be going into the mold into the kiln heated and pressed and that's how you end up with the racket so they ran from the stage and the area where they had us over to their workshop which i thought was quite cool so it's actually the racket that they were making in the layup on stage is actually the racket you see here on the um, on the screen and this is how they start prepping it for the mold this is one of their molds i think this is the red racket so that's their power frame if i'm not mistaken and um, and this is their mold and they prep it put it in the kiln and uh, by the end of it in about 20 minutes we come out with a pressed racket for those that maybe don't know this is actually a process that needs to be done to every racket regardless of sort of brand or price whether it's a cheap racket or an expensive racket there's a lot of human labor that goes into making rackets there's not um, you know that it's not fully machined fully automatic so there is really a lot of uh, time and effort that go into making any racket and here you can really sort of appreciate uh, the time it takes to make just one so obviously in large factories it's on a big scale but the actual sort of process is the same As you can see, they, they pay a lot of attention to really making sure that the carbon fiber is uh, evenly spread in the mold before they put it in the kiln. That, that's going to give you the best extraction. Make sure that the heat passes through the inner tube, expands the racket evenly, and you get a clean, well-made racket at the end of it. I can see they are now adding it to the oven to the kiln where there will be um, air pressure run through the racket to expand the carbon fiber as the resin is heated and then dried. Here it took about 15 to 20 minutes for it to um, to fully cure, to fully finish before they could get it back out again. Perhaps, I'm not sure if it's the same in larger factories or they can speed the process up a little bit. This workshop is made for making test frames and um, examples and one-offs and things like that. So they obviously they're not looking to do big batch volume rackets. However, you know they still have all the right machinery to make rackets right there on site, which I thought was really nice.
on est quand même sur deux personnes qui ont l'expérience et l'entraînement. They even went on to show us the software they use that runs simulations on different racket layups, what they're going to sort of uh, bring from a frame before they even make them, which I thought was really interesting to see. That's something I've not seen before, maybe you've not seen it either. And depending um, where they add the information from their layup sheet directly into the software, and it actually tells them, you know, if they might have any imbalances or any sort of weak points or perhaps the um, the possible size of the sweet spot. All these things are, are run in the software, so they can actually sort of have a good idea of what the racket's going to be like before they make it, which obviously reduces a lot of time and cost in making loads of unnecessary frames. So I thought that was really interesting. It's something I've not seen before, and um, and I thought that was, that was nice of them to show us. You know, you can literally see their whole layout plans, and they were very open about everything, which was, which was good. Caractéristique de la raquette. Donc, on va pouvoir avoir son poids, sa balance, son inertie, d'autres valeurs qui nous intéressent, le spin weight, le twist weight, le recall weight, etc. La polarisation. Et si même on a envie de pousser. They also showed us some live simple stress tests on the frames, um, obviously sort of applying pressure to the frame unstrung um, horizontally and vertically, which they obviously I guess gives them a reading of when it you know when it breaks and stuff like that. But I'm they also said that obviously they do more tests on twisting, impact, things like that, but they just weren't able to show us everything. But still it was nice of them to give us a little insight into how they even test the frames once they've been made. Et donc, bon, du coup, on connaît à quelle force la raquette vient de casser. Donc là, Vianney va nous faire un petit zoom, exactement, sur les zones de casse de raquette. Ici, ici et ici. So naturally, the next thing is that they discussed how they came up with the ideas and inspiration behind the racket cosmetics and the theme that they wanted to run with with the frames themselves. As you can see, it's very much sort of earth and air um, themes, which I like as ideas. I think the concepts of them is nice. However, I just from you know a racket painting point of view, I the one sort of disappointment I have is actually the cosmetics of the frames themselves. I think even though they're nice and simple, they could have perhaps used slightly different tones or different sort of making them a little bit more eye-catching or perhaps a little bit sort of more high value looking rackets. I think they're still a little bit simple. Um, however, I'm sure that's something that they're gonna sort of look at in the future. They even showed us their paint booth and where they do sort of the initials painting for the frames. Obviously, this looks very similar to the setup that um, I have here, um, where they use their airbrush to sort of, they have everything masked off and then they paint the rackets and, um, and then add all the details afterwards. Even the color red they chose, I'm sure they did a lot of testing and got feedback from you know, a lot of people, so I'm sure it's not something that they just kind of picked out of nowhere, but for me, from you know, from the earth and sort of air feeling like a really sort of let's say classic red would not personally be my first choice or my first association with earth itself. It's kind of more, I guess, fire. Um, however, you know, it's uh, I'm sure they have their reasons for it, and they um, they did a good job ch showing us, you know, like how they make all their stencils and they add them, you know, to the, the decals to the water bath and then apply them to the frames. This, this could be obviously a process that a lot of you may never have seen before and this is how all the details of all rackets are added whether that's say junior racket for 15 euros or a you know a top of the line model for 300 euros so this is cool to see you know they i mean i'm sure that they in the factories they have them they have them pre-cut um, obviously again they're doing this on like a demo size in their workshop at the uh, headquarters um, but it's the same process it's a decal that separates and then they apply it to the racket it dries and then they gloss the racket on top of that Ça 
Donc là, il est sur le départ de la semaine dernière, particulièrement. Non, là, là il est en train de poser, vous voyez, il a posé le décal avec marqué Art and Gold, c'est la signature de la marque. Là, il pose le décal avec le nom de la raquette, la TR 990. C'est notre power. Et j'ai entendu parler d'une peinture qui était la peinture poudrée qui a priori tenait un petit peu moins. Ouais, Donc, alors, pas forcément sur C'est une bonne question. La peinture poudre, c'est un autre process en fait, qui permet de colorer le, les raquettes. Sauf que c'est un process déjà qui ne fonctionne que sur l'aluminium. Parce qu'on vient projeter une poudre qui se fixe par le magnétisme. Et ensuite, il faut faire choper ça très 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 fort pour qu'elle fonde euh, sur le produit. Et euh, la poudre carbone ne résiste pas aux températures. <rire> While they were showing us the design process and the cosmetics and everything, the racket had time to finish curing and now it's time to get it out of the mold. And as you can see, what's quite interesting, you see all the excess resin from the carbon fiber that binds all the carbon fiber that's been pressed out of the racket and uh, that needs to be cleaned off. And that, this happens for all frames, whether it's, um, uh, it doesn't matter the mold, there's always going to be excess resin that needs to be removed. And they actually left it on there, which was cool. They took it out of the mold, left the resin on there, and then they actually ran this frame back to the studio, or back to the stage. And we got to see the racket up close and personal with all the excess resin on, so you really see what it looks like straight out of the mold. So I thought that was quite cool. That was a nice little touch. And we're going to have a look at that in a second. They finished with another promotional video, which, you know, everything looks really great, well shot, and then they went on to sort of talk a little bit about the aspirations for Artengo in the next few years and their players that they have and things like this. I think from all in all, as I sort of earlier mentioned, and I'll do a full recap after this, but I think that they did a really good job in showcasing the work the lots and lots of work that goes into making just one racket so people can appreciate the effort and the workmanship that goes into every single racket that you play with as you can see the racket is back from the workstation and as i said the you can see all the excess resin on it um, that would normally just be uh, sort of sanded or sawed off um, and that, like I said, it happens to every single racket. So just, you know, just that is time consuming in itself. If you want to produce rackets, it's a lot of work that goes into every single frame. So next time you play, make sure you take care of your frame and you appreciate it a little bit more. So I just finished the Decathlon Ace event. It was really cool. It was about an hour and a half long. I'll go into a little bit more detail when I get back to the hotel, as you can hear, it's still a little bit loud. Now there's time for some drinks next door. Going to speak to a few of the people from Decathlon. But basically the event, as you saw, kind of went over how they make their rackets, how they go into detail on what sort of are their key core values of the business, of the company, how they design their rackets. It was a really cool insight into how rackets are made properly. You know, you, know, you can find videos online from different brands and stuff, but they really went open source, let's say, with the, the layups, with how they go about it and a full live demonstration, which was really cool. Um, and they managed to actually sort of from the event, run a racket back to the um, back to the workshop, fire it, paint it a little bit and get it back in time. All in all, really good stuff. And um, I will recap and catch you guys a little bit later. So I just got back from the Artengo Ace event and it was a really great evening. I got to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff and speak to a lot of people that went into designing the rackets, making the event also sort of uh, from a production point of view, engineering and stuff. So all in all, a really good, nice evening, a really cool evening. And what I especially liked from Artengo was their openness in terms of how they uh, just showed, well, I mean, they literally made a racket in front of us, uh, how the layups, you know, they, they went into more depth, in-depth information than perhaps a lot of the other companies did. And I, and I feel that's, you know, that's a, that's a nice thing to see from such a big company. Because, you know, a lot of times people are like a big company is very closed off and they don't want to show too much. So it was nice to really have an open kind of uh, an open source kind of way of making rackets. Because there are, you know, there are a couple of things online that you can find about how rackets are made and old videos and stuff. But it was nice to see, obviously, live. And they really went into a lot of detail to explain how and why they did certain things. So I thought that was really good. I mean, it wasn't perhaps anything new for me personally, but in terms of 
for a lot of people, I think they could learn a lot from, from what you watching the event. What was interesting to me was how much input they put in to thinking about how they design a racket or their sort of the, the subject behind the design of the racket. You know, it was, they were very much with their um, earth and their air, which I think was cool. Um, I still feel from a, personally, from a design point of view, they could do a little bit more in terms of the colors, in terms of, this, I like the silo because it's quite simple, but I think that they, you know, they could do a little bit more. They could develop the design a little bit more. However, I do appreciate that obviously they're a very new brand in terms of tennis. Uh, they've only been kind of really focusing hard on tennis since about 2017. So they're playing catch up on all the big names. Obviously they've got the, <clears throat> the structure and the, the facilities and the finance behind it to do so. But at the same time, you can't, you know, you can't fake experience. So they do need to make more models of rackets. They do need to fail some rackets. They need to have success at some rackets, which I think they will. I think obviously, like I said, because they have the facilities, because they have the money behind, uh, behind the brand to do well, I think they, I think they can do really well. I think in three to five years, they could be, you know, they could be a big name in, in rackets. From a personal point of view afterwards, it was nice to meet some of the people that were kind of were part of like the behind the scenes of designing the rackets and uh, and obviously how they're made and things like that you know they're very passionate they all seem very passionate with tennis they all play tennis so it's even though it's such a big brand decathlon they're not just kind of let's say china made products so i think that was really what they were trying to show and uh, and i think they did a really good job at it that you know that they are that the artengo brand their tennis specific brand they are people that you know that play tennis live tennis tennis fans um you know they have their own workshop they can prototype in-house there at the at site you know so for players to come and test rackets they can you know so it's not just um big production at low cost you know they really put a lot of effort into it you know the one thing that i guess maybe decathlon and artengo are battling against is that they are known for perhaps lower cost and perhaps therefore you expect kind of less good products but they uh, they really put a lot of time a lot of effort the same way all the other brands would and i really appreciate it from them and then afterwards, one of the few things that I really liked, I liked that their kids' rackets were really cool. I think that they've perhaps done something that I've not seen before. Maybe maybe it has been done, but I've not seen it. They put a lot of emphasis into markers on the rackets and cues and tips for kids that are learning to play. So from, you know, from the age of three all the way up to, I think, to well, obviously they do all junior rackets, but this range was up to 11 uh, with markers on having to make sure the racket's in the ready position, having little figures on the rackets, uh, make sure you can see them, you know, showing clearly where the impact zone is, things like that, how to like markers on the grips and things like that. So I think that was that was really nice because it was a little bit different. And uh, I think it looked to me seemed like a really good tool for learners. So I think um, they could do really well if they can get the name out well enough to really showcase the, the things that they have. And then the other thing that really impressed me was their um, clothing line. Their clothing line, I have to say, was very, very good. I mean, I'm not that surprised with obviously all the clothing that they do but again i think i probably had this anticipation that being artengo and decathlon maybe you know the quality wasn't going to be as good or anything but i mean it was was really really good i mean if you put <clears throat> a on logo lululemon logo nike logo you know you they would be 60 70 euros a t-shirt and stuff like that the quality i have to say felt really 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 good so definitely keep an eye out for the tennis specific the you know, I guess probably their like highest range tennis um, line of clothing, both for the men's and women's, but the clothing was really, really nice. Simple stuff, uh, some cool colors, not too busy, no funny prints, nothing like crazy going on. So I think that they did a really good job there. I had a look at the shoes, not tested them, not tried them. Um, they look fine. Obviously, depending how they play, they, they look like shape-wise, kind of, I guess, like a Homer shoe or more of an Adidas shoe. So a little bit kind of like a larger upper um but again i would imagine they'd be pretty good from again from all the research that they could probably pull from all the other shoes they've made across so many other sports so that's i think one part of artengo and decathlon that they can really sort of excel on compared to maybe a few of the other brands is that they can draw so much help so much information and um things that they can improve on uh, on products with from all the other aspects of their brand from they i mean they cover every sport from ping pong to kayaking to fishing to everything so you know so there's such a versatility and and 
um, where we were today at their headquarters, they have everything. I mean, so they all kind of, I mean, they work separately, but they all work together. Um, so it was, it was all in all a cool, cool evening, cool experience. The thing that is going to hold them back or what they need to really work on is uh, to get their brand image out in terms of it being a proper serious tennis brand. And that's going to probably be their biggest battle. But in terms of quality across everything they did, it was really good. And all in all, it was a great event. So I hope you enjoyed this video, even without Jonas. And as always, don't forget to play some tennis.